The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden from Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, if you live in the U.S. or Europe or any of the advanced economies of Northeast Asia, it's safe to say that the mood about China today is grim and getting worse, a lot worse. And you hear a lot about how China's public approval rating is now at historic lows. And that's often led by media reporting that is a worldwide phenomenon now. You'll see a lot of reporting on this issue that is based on data, namely the Pew Research Center. So Pew has a survey that's often quoted and cited as an example of how China's public opinion has been falling around the world. Their latest survey came out earlier this year, and they surveyed more than 24,000 people in 19 countries, all except one country, Malaysia, would be considered wealthy, advanced economies. And here's some of the findings that they found. The U.S. far outperforms China in their survey, comparing favorability views on the U.S. and China. In South Korea, 89% for the U.S., 19% for the Chinese. In Germany, the U.S. received 63% favorable rating, while the Chinese were just at 20%. And it was the same story in Canada, Holland, the U.K., France, and Italy. And we see this all over the global north. But it's a very, very different story in less developed countries throughout the global south, especially in Africa and the Middle East. There are a few surveys that are widely regarded as being among the most credible in polling people's views on both the U.S. and China. Let's start with the Arab Barometer survey from last year. China outperformed the U.S. by large margins, especially in North Africa, where China's favorability rating in Algeria, Morocco, and Libya were all above 60%. And in many of those countries, they see the U.S., in fact, as a greater threat than China. Of course, Kobus, this won't come as a surprise to you and a lot of people in the region. Because of the U.S. history in the Mideast, that, again, is what should be expected. In Africa, the polling data indicates that positive sentiment about the Chinese is equally strong, in fact. And there are two surveys that I want to point you to on this. The Ishikovitz Family Foundation in June of this year surveyed 4,500 young people in 15 African countries. And for the first time, the Chinese surpassed the United States. 77% saw China as the most influential foreign power active in Africa and only 67% said the same of the United States. Again, that is the first time that has happened. Back in 2020, when they did their last survey, 83% of respondents said that the U.S. influence was positive, while the figure was 79% for China. So the numbers have changed, and China has pulled ahead in that sense. And then there is Afrobarometer. Afrobarometer is by far considered to be the most authoritative polling agency and surveys that they produce on these subjects. Their surveys are widely considered to be the most reputable, largely because of their methodology and the fact that they really cover the largest cross-section of African societies compared to any other poll. Let's talk about their survey on China. They had inputs from 34 different countries and found that almost two-thirds, 63% of Africans, say the economic and political influence of China in their country is either, quote, somewhat positive or very positive, while just one in seven consider it to be a negative. Kobus, that goes starkly against the narratives that we hear in a lot of media outside of Africa. We hear that, again, the perceptions of the Chinese are much more negative than what Afrobarometer found. And also, the, the favorability rating was higher than with the United States. That just tracked a 60% approval. So another surprising input from Afrobarometer. But Afrobarometer's data reveals that most Africans have very complex views of their relationship with the Chinese and the Americans, favoring in some areas and really being much more skeptical in other areas. For example, when asked which of the two superpowers offers the best model for development, the United States was far ahead of China, 33% to 22%. And it's a similar story when it comes to governance specifically the role of democracy. In fact, this was an issue that came up on Monday when U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken 
unveiled Washington's new strategy for Africa that puts democracy as one of four new pillars for its policy on the continent. Let's take a listen to some of the Secretary's address at the University of Pretoria, where he uses the Afrobarometer data to make his case. For as long as they've had their independence, African countries have also recognized that the right of nations to chart their own path is bound up in ensuring the right of individual citizens to do the same thing. So this brings me to our second priority, working with African partners to fulfill the promise of democracy. The overwhelming majority of people across Africa prefer democracy to any other form of government. Even greater majorities oppose the authoritarian alternatives to democracy. More than 70% reject military rule. More than 80% reject one-man rule, according to the Africa-based polling organization Afrobarometer. African citizens want democracy. That is clear. The question, the question is whether African governments can make democracy deliver by improving the lives of their citizens in tangible ways. (laughs) <laughs> that is a challenge that is not unique to Africa. It's one facing democracies in every part of the world, including the United States. Okay, Kobus, let's get your take both on the Secretary's comments and on this gap in perception about the Chinese in the global north versus the views in places like Africa and parts of the global south. It's, yeah, it, 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 was, it was very satisfying for me to hear the Secretary citing Afrobarometer because it is this, the, the research that everyone cites in, in the Africa-China space. You know, kind of it's, it's the most authoritative kind of, um, you know, research of, of, of this kind. And, and it's, it's just, you know, I'm glad to see it was informing policy. Um, I think the, you know, what's, it, it is very interesting to see how it breaks down so you know, so starkly in kind of north and south, um, you know, between the global north and the global south. Um, in the global north case, I think it, it, it's clear, it, or, it, or it, you know, arguably it reveals the the power of, of, of kind of the press, press framing of China in the world, particularly, particularly in, in, you know, kind of the power of the kind of China threat narratives in relation to the, the established position of these, of these countries themselves. It's also very interesting to see it kind of like how it, how it changes in relation to between Germany and, and South Korea, for example, you know, kind of different kinds of disapproval of China. Um, but then also in the global south, I think what what's really interesting is to see how there is a the a, a split between between kind of approval of China as, for example, an economic partner versus you know um, versus you know accepting China's China's kind of mode of govern of governance. Um, those are two different things, and then it's, it's it's interesting to see the kind of nuance among Africa among global south publics around that particular issue. Well, let's get some perspective on those perceptions and the polling from the CEO of Afrobarometer, Joseph Asunka, who joins us on the line today from Northern California. Joseph, it's great to speak with you again, and thank you so much for taking the time this morning to join us on the show. Great. Thank you so much, Eric, for the opportunity to join you this morning, and thanks for that introduction and you know the soundbite by Secretary Blinken. I think that's a great endorsement of the work we do. That's an enormous validation of the great quality of work that you're doing and really the contribution that you're making to the discourse. Uh, First, I'd like to get your reaction to Blinken's speech and whether the findings from the Afrobarometer surveys on democracy that the secretary cited uh, do align, in fact, with the research that you found. I mean, in the sense of did he use the data correctly and reflect it properly to articulate the mood of the people that you surveyed in 34 countries? Absolutely. I mean, the data is right on point. All the figures he mentioned were directly, you know, I think the researchers who did this work for him did a great job in getting the figures all correct. So, yes, all his points were right. The fact that Africans prefer democracy to any other form of government is very clear. It's only in a few countries where we have a minority of citizens saying they prefer democracy, but for the vast majority you know, you have in some countries up to 90% of the population say they prefer democracy to any other form of government. So yes, Secretary Blinken was very correct on his numbers. 
So doing this kind of research in, you know, in countries where people don't necessarily have phone lines or, you know, it's not necessarily so easy to easy to contact them. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about about how Afrobarometer actually does their surveys and how how they actually manage to speak to all of these different people uh, across these regions. All right. So for the African continent, and as we've always um, mentioned in terms of our methodology, we use face to face interviews. We do this because we know that phone penetration is not yet as widespread, especially in some countries, to allow for a balanced and nationally representative sample. So the best we can get in terms of rigor and high quality of data and making sure that the voices of everyone is represented in the survey, we do face-to-face interviews. So we send our researchers into the field, they walk into the households, And then even before they get to the households, we have already pre-selected the enumeration areas in which they would select the households to interview the, the people. And so the process of selecting which enumeration areas to interview, which households to interview, and which individual in the household to interview is all randomized. And so, yes, because of that process, we are able to reach the most marginal communities on the continent, partly because the process is random and wherever the selection process leads us to, we send our researchers into the field to do that. And we usually would interview people in the language of their choice. So in each country, we translate the instrument into the major local languages that are spoken. So in every country, if a language is spoken by more than 5% of the population, we translate the questionnaire into those languages. And we ask the respondents to choose the language they want to be interviewed in, and we interview them in that language. And it's that rigor that you bring to the process, which is why your data is cited by policymakers like Secretary Blinken. Let's dive into some of the findings from the research on China. And again, 63% gave a favorable rating to China, 60% to the United States, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Can you give us a few insights as to what the data says about the perceptions of China compared to the United States? Right, so in terms of China and the United States, the overall, the top line is that the two countries in the eyes of Africans go hand in hand. And so when perceptions about whether it is the influence or the type of model that they want their country to be, it's often the case that people see the influence of China in the United States almost in the same light. And this is likely because of the benefits the you know, two countries, superpowers bring. And you know, the figures you cited, you know, we asked our respondents, Across all of these um, institutions and countries and bilateral donors who engage with our country, do you think that they have had a positive influence or a negative influence? And you're exactly right. 63% felt that China has had a very positive influence in, on, in their countries. This is followed by the United States at 60%. And so the two countries are just neck on neck when it comes to that because this is within our margin of error. 63 and a 3 percentage point gap is not considered significant. So that's within the margin of error, telling us that the United States and China are neck on neck and top of mind on, the, on Africans in terms of the positive influence they've brought in, in their countries. You can break this down by different ways. So even if we look across countries, we still see that kind that kind of gap. So in each country, we have the data that shows that across all the countries, we see a similar rating of the United States and China. There's really not no significant gap even when we look across the different countries. And what do you make of that of that kind of close, you know, twinning of those two those those two factors? You know, because because as countries the two are very different. So do you think it's mostly a factor just simply because there are very big economic powers that, that have potentially have very very large kind of developmental impacts? Or is, you know, is there a kind of a, 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 from an African perspective, a kind of similarity between the two that you think people are picking up on? So I think there are similarities and big differences. So similarities in terms of the economic influence. And these are two nations that have really influential impact when it comes to economic development, especially infrastructure. You know, talking of infrastructure, Chinese, you know, China has had a major impact in terms of shaping Africa's infrastructure. And this is very visible. 
The same way the United States has had a lot of impact when it comes to the economic you know, influence in their countries. But I do think that the U.S. goes beyond that into the political sphere, sphere where they have quite a bit of influence, especially when it comes to the promotion of democracy on the continent. And I do think, you know, the new U.S.-Africa strategy that Blinken laid out yesterday at the Investor Pretoria does make this clear. Because the U.S. is both bringing in the economic benefits as well as the governance aspects where Africans are really yearning for, especially when it comes to accountable governance. Because our data shows that increasingly lots of Africans are yearning for accountable governance. It's just not democracy. They really want to see their leaders accountable to the people. And so when we ask Africans whether they will choose between an accountable government that is not very effective or an effective government that is not accountable, they, will, they chose the, the, the former. In that case, they want accountability as opposed to just being effective. And so I think the U.S. has that influence there, and that is what people experience, that the U.S. has the democracy angle to their engagement as well as the economic benefits. I think China has bubbled up quite significantly because of its impact on the economic front and less so on the political front, even though what they do on the economic front has implications for the politics in the, on the continent. Well, if that's the case, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the future because the levels of Chinese financing for infrastructure have fallen dramatically over the past several years and to the point now where they're not really funding large-scale infrastructure anywhere near what they used to do. So if infrastructure was a major driver of Chinese favorable public opinion among Africans, then that might be an interesting hit there. Also, the fact that the United States is promoting transparency and good governance and democracy, which, according to you and your findings, aligns with what young people on the continent seem to want. It does seem that the trend looking forward may be favorable to the United States. Also, I'd like to get your take. There's a perception out there among a lot of young people, and this is anecdotal, so it's not scientific, but I'd like to see if I can bounce it off of you to get your take if the data reveals this as well, that because the Chinese don't work with civil society groups anywhere near like what other powers do, also there's a perception that they are in collusion, and that's a word that often is used in terms of their relationships with Africa's governing elites, and they don't promote transparency in their contracts and in their engagements, that the Chinese in many ways are seen as part of the problem of a lack of transparency and accountability in African governments and public spaces. Does your data support some of that skeptical view of China in terms of its role in governance? Right, yeah, thanks for that. So first of all, just looking at the, the relative, you know, the influence of Africa, I mean, China going forward in terms of its investment and the pullback on infrastructure, I do agree that increasingly what is happening on the continent is you know, the inf investment in infrastructure is what attracted people's attention. I think increasingly with lots of Chinese on the African continent, and especially when it comes to the interpersonal relationships between Africans and Chinese in different spheres, especially when it comes to nat natural resource extraction. I do think that it's gotten to a point where lots of people are getting more and more frustrated with the way Chinese engage with Africans on the continent. And you have seen this on the news all along, all across the board, across the continent, where the interaction between African citizens and Chinese citizens has not been that you know, pleasant in many places. And so there's that kind of backlash. But then if China begins to pull off from the infrastructure side, I do think that that is going to have a major impact on how people view China on the continent. And this is my expectation that it is increasingly going to be the case that the influence of China on the continent is likely to diminish because of that. And as you rightly also pointed out, I think young people on the continent are increasingly more looking into how they can hold their governments accountable for what they do. And I mentioned that they've been, you know, in my initial remarks that China's interventions <coughs> has some implications for the politics on the continent. And I said so because when you see the 
absence of openness and transparency around what they do with governments, and largely because of the lack of engagement with civil society. Even though I should hint here that China is increasingly looking into engaged civil society groups on the continent, and so that may be an angle that might come with some kind of push to make sure that China's engagement with governments are more open and transparent. Of course, this is on a limited scale because they haven't proactively reached out to civil society. But I think that over time, as they pull back on the infrastructure side and looking at the tensed relationship that exists between Chinese citizens and African citizens, any engagement with civil society could help to push you know, China towards you know, engaging governments in a more open way. But I can't bank my hopes on this. I just I know that there has been some instances of they reaching out to civil society and trying to engage. But I, I do think that over time, as China becomes more and more, you know, pulling out of the infrastructure, the heavy investment and taking on to the soft side of, you know, policy engagement, it can have the effect of in not really making an impression on African citizens. And I can see this diminishing. I'm actually waiting to see what happens in our next round of surveys, which is currently ongoing, as to what Africans' views are on China's influence. But on the young people in particular, I do think this is where the, 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 the attraction for the U.S. model as a model, for, a model for development is very strong among young people. And I think that over time, and especially with this new Africa strategy, given the direction in which it is going, especially you know, openness, transparency, climate change, and they are all issues that resonate very well with young people on the continent. And I think that increasingly it's going to be the young people who would in more and more see the U.S. as a model compared to that of China. You know, the, the reporting about Afrobarometer's work frequently tends to focus on this issue of the, the, the United States versus China and, and the different perceptions of, of the two. But you also track the influence of other actors, including former colonial powers, powers on the continent like South Africa um, and UN agencies. So I was wondering how those other actors, how, how kind of approval ratings of those have shifted in relation to China um, on the continent. Right. So when it comes to the former colonial powers, I think that was one of the surprising things we found. Um, barely half of Africans think that the influence of their former colonial powers have been positive. So this is exactly 46%. But the, the unfortunate thing is that it's actually the former colonial powers that a quarter of Africans think that their influence has been largely negative. And this is the highest across all the countries and institutions that we've asked of, of as our respondents. So China's influence being negative, only 14% says China's influence is negative, 13% says the U.S. influence is negative, and I come to talk about regional superpowers like South Africa is at 17%. It is only the former colonial powers that is 25%. Even Russia the negative influence is only 17%. And so it does seem like there is this sense of that the former colonial powers had had this negative influence on the continent. But by and large, if you look at the global you know, bodies like the United Nations, the regional alliances and the African Union, we have just a little above half of Africans who think that the influence have been positive. So compared to former colonial powers, except for Russia, where we have only 35% of Africans saying that the influence has been positive, the next lowest is the former colonial powers. But everyone else that we've asked of our respondents has had a majority view. It's interesting because these are not storylines that we hear very often in the US and Europe and other places like that, especially about the Chinese, but about all the other foreign powers. When you hear Ursula von der Leyen at the European Commission talk about Global Gateway, she makes it sound like it's going to be received with chocolates and flowers in, in much of Africa. And as you're pointing out, the task ahead for the Europeans as the former colonial powers is very large to make up for some of the massive deficits and trust that they have after centuries of exploitation. So I think that's absolutely very interesting. When you're here in the United States and when you travel to Europe, and you and I were just together in the Middle East, 
People often will ask you about the different perceptions of China, the U.S., and others in Africa that you survey. What's the biggest mistake that people make in trying to understand the current views of the African publics you survey? Right. I think one of the the the, the, the biggest mistakes is thinking that um, I mean two things. One that China is bringing its political model into Africa by trying to introduce autocratic rule. But as our data have shown, no matter how Africans have rated the influence of China and seen the Chinese model as the model for development for their countries, at least about nearly a quarter of Africans thinking so, when it comes to democracy, that is a completely different question. And it is very clear that even though the Chinese engagement in the economic space has implications for the political space or the politics on the continent, the vast majority of Africans still stand by democracy as the government model that they want to adopt in their countries. And I say this because even if we look across the groups of people who say they prefer the Chinese model to the U.S. model and then look at their views in terms of support for democracy and rejection of other non-democratic rule, there's absolutely no difference. So we have 79% and 80% between the China and U.S., those who prefer the China to the U.S. model, saying they reject one-party rule. The same 78%, 79% saying that they support presidential term limits. So we know that whether people prefer the Chinese model, if in, among those who prefer the Chinese model and those who think the Chinese impact has been positive, their views about democracy has not shifted over the last you know, 10 years that we've been asking this question consistently. And so they, that there's this misconception that because... Africans see um, China as having this influence, they may, be, they may be attracted to the Chinese political system, but that is absolutely not the case. The second thing I want to point out is that the economic benefits that comes with China's engagement is several. Of course, the infrastructure is very visible, but of course, the Chinese are able to manufacture products that are affordable to most Africans. And so you can buy a phone that is very functional, and yet you can, they, have, they can access the such phones. I mean, high-quality phones that come from the United States are far from people's access. Lots of Africans cannot buy those phones. And so there are certain things that the Chinese are able to provide on to the African citizen in ways that makes them feel like they are part of and they can access these resources at a lower rate compared to other products on the market. And so that influence also has had this you know, um, attraction of the Chinese development model to, to most Africans. You know, in, in, in looking at the split between between approval of China on the one hand and then and then uh, approval of democracy on the other, um, did you get any kind of do you get any any indication from from the data about how people who who hold both of those views, you know, kind of how they think about 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 what the nature of Chinese involvement on the continent is like, you know, so so if they're not thinking if they're thinking about China as an investor as a provider of products. And not as as a political model, you know. When, when they then say that that um, China is you know kind of is is a useful model for Africa, what what kind of aspects of the Chinese system do you think that they are specifically thinking about? Right. So here we can only infer. So our inference is that the people look at China as you know one a country that has been able to provide a lot of economic benefits to its citizens and providing jobs, employment, and in ways that allow people to lead good lives. You know? And so when people think of China, it's more about the, good, the, the ability to lead you know, a good life. You, know, you have access to various facilities that are mostly lacking on the continent. Maybe there's water, you guys have access to water, you have access to electricity. And so the basic necessities of life in some ways are taken care of in, 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 the, in the Chinese system. And so if their country can also get to that stage where they can have easy access 
to some of these uh, facilities or the basic necessities of life. That is a good thing for them. Second, that they are able to influence the global you know, system where you grow to a point where you become a superpower and you have influence at the global level in many, in some ways. And so seeing Africa as aspiring to the point where they can become like a superpower on the continent is also another value that people see. And so that, that attraction is mostly about the economic benefits of what China brings and what that would mean for their own livelihoods. And of course, when we ask Africans about you know, their thoughts about their current country's economic conditions, the direction of the country and the like, Across several countries, there's just this gloomy view of thinking that the country is headed in the wrong direction. You know, unemployment is a massive issue and everybody wants their governments to address. But, and they then think of that in terms of what China is able to provide or has been able to do in their own country. That is where the attraction, you know, is, is, is. But when it comes to the politics, that one, there's just no compromise. At least not yet. We haven't seen a compromise in any country, except for a few. And I'll mention this um, just for uh, your listeners to notice that we have seen a few countries in which people are getting more and more disillusioned about democracy. And that doesn't mean that they are giving up. It's just that they are disappointed in its delivery. Do, do you happen to have to remember kind of some of which some of those countries that are getting, you know, kind of a little disenchanted with democracy? I think, I mean, South Africa is on top of that. And that is surprising to us. I mean, maybe not too surprising, but surprising in the sense that this is the first time that we surveyed in South Africa and we have a minority of citizens saying that they prefer democracy to any other form of government. We've never recorded that in South Africa until this round, which was between 2019 and 2021. Angola, we also have the same challenge, but we believe that Angola is because people are just coming to terms of what democracy is, and we had a lot of don't knows. But there are the two countries where we see, you know, a sense of people really not. That's where we have a minority view, and South Africa in particular, because it is the first time we've recorded this. If you want to better understand some of the complex views that Africans have that revealed themselves in the Afrobarometer survey, I recommend that you go to their website and you can see a lot of research there. I'm going to put links in the show notes to one article in particular, Africans Welcome China's Influence But Maintain Democratic Aspirations. And this is the kind of thing that you're going to find in the Afrobarometer research is that it really defies the simple narratives. These are very complex perspectives that a lot of people have, where it's a both and rather than an either or. You can find whatever you want in this data because it's all there. And this is one of the points that Kobus and I have made for the 12 years that we have been doing this podcast that Afro Barometer confirms. The good and the bad of China's engagement in Africa sit side by side one another and are inseparable. And what the data finds is that's what the vast majority of African publics also find. They like a lot about the Chinese engagement, but at the same time, they still want the democracy and some of the things that the Chinese are less comfortable in promoting. Joseph Asunka, thank you so much for taking the time today to walk us through the data, to introduce us to what Afrobarometer is doing. When can we expect the next survey to come out? Thank you so much, Eric. So the next survey is almost, um, we should be concluding by November. And so in early December or early January next year, we should have some of the results come out. Uh, we've already completed about 20 countries. That data is ready now, but we want to complete the surveys in up to 40 countries. So by January, we should have all the data from the 40 countries available. Well, we're excited to have you and the team to come back on the show and to explain us the findings next year about the surveys. In the meantime, though, if people would like to follow the work that Afrobarometer and your team are doing, where can they find you? Right, so we are on several platforms. So first of all, our website, which is afrobarometer.org, which is, has all the information, as you mentioned. But we are on, we have uh, social media handles across all the, 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 the major social media. So whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, it's just at Afrobarometer. Once you search Afrobarometer, you would find, find us there. And you are also on Twitter as well. So if people want to follow what you're reading and writing, where can they find you? Absolutely. So my mine is at Joe Asunka. So if you 
but at J O E A S U N K A. That is where my Twitter handle is. And most of the work that we do with Afrobarometer is connected to my my Twitter feed as well. And so people can find me there as well as in LinkedIn. Just search for Joa Joa Sonka. Fantastic. We will put links to all of that, including Joseph's Twitter handle, if you'd like to follow what he's doing. Joseph Asunka, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Eric, and thanks, Kobus, for making the time. This is really exciting, and I look forward to staying in touch and sharing updates with you. Kobus, I cannot wait to have Joseph and his team from Afrobarometer back on the show in January after we've had a chance to see the updated data, because if, in fact, that China's popularity in Africa has been rooted in its economic engagement— That's going to take a hit. I think he's absolutely right because the pullback in Chinese economic investment and engagement, particularly in the financing space for infrastructure, has fallen precipitously. So one has to wonder how will that play itself out in public perceptions. That being said, and I think he alluded to this as well, we cannot overstate the importance of China's corporate presence in Africa. Boomplay, StarTimes, Huawei, Transin, all of these brands are hugely important, and they do contribute to China's soft power and public perceptions. People know that these brands come from China. So it's not just in the state space that we have to keep an eye on, but also in the corporate and private sector levels as well, which are also, I think, very important in terms of shaping public opinion. Yeah, and I think these these companies are going to start playing a bigger role in terms of shaping perceptions of China maybe than infrastructure investment over the the next while. But it's going to be very interesting to see how, how long it takes for these kind of shifts in financing to register and then whether anyone else fills up that gap. Well, that's what the United States hopes to do with its new PGII, also the Global Gateway hopes to fill that infrastructure gap. Personally, I'm skeptical, given the fact that we just haven't seen a lot of action from the United States and Europe on this. Yes, a little bit trickles in, a few hundred million dollars here, a few hundred million dollars there. But let's remember that the infrastructure financing deficit in Africa is about 100 to $120 billion a year. We're looking at over a trillion dollars in 10 years. So again, when Blinken in his speech at the University of Pretoria, and we're going to play some sound from that, talked about $300 million initiative for data centers and uh, and another, you know, tens of million dollars initiatives for other things. That's very small relative to the need and the challenges that are ahead. Let's turn our attention to Anthony Blinken's big foray into Africa. He's currently in the midst of a three-country tour as part of a nine-day Asia-Africa tour. He started the tour in South Africa over the weekend. On Monday, he went to the University of Pretoria to announce the new U.S. strategy for sub-Saharan Africa. It was a very interesting day. We dedicated our entire issue of our newsletter on Tuesday to the new U.S.-Africa strategy and the impact on China. It was absolutely fascinating. Cobus wrote a very, very interesting column that's now on our homepage, so I invite you to go and check that out. One of the key themes that came up in the discussions, though, was this question of whether or not the United States is pressuring African countries to choose. And Minister of International Relations and Cooperation in South Africa, Naledi Pandor, she was very, very direct in saying this is not the case, that the United States is not forcing other countries in Africa to choose between the U.S. and China, despite what the Chinese themselves are saying on this issue. Let's take a listen to Minister Pandor and her comments on this. Countries are free to establish relationships with different countries. African countries that wish to relate to China, let them do so, whatever the particular form of relationships would be. Uh, We can't be made party to a conflict between China and the United States of America. And I may say it does cause instability for all of us because it affects the global economic uh, system. Um, We we really hope that uh, the United States and China will arrive at a point of rapprochement where all of us can look to economic development and growth for all our countries, because that's extremely important for all of us. And these are two great powers, the two biggest economies in the world. They've got to find a way of working together to allow us to grow. I have to say, I didn't, I didn't 100%, maybe I didn't like kind of understand her the same way you did, but I didn't particularly kind of see her as saying that the US isn't currently trying to push 
countries to choose sides. I think she was she was pushing back on both sides, saying like, "Stop making us try." Um, no, in this case, earlier in the press conference, she turned to Secretary Blinken and did say that the United States is not pressuring her. So that is interesting. But she did allude to the fact that she faces this pressure from other governments. And that too is also interesting as well. But I think in many ways, Minister Pandora was channeling the sentiments of a lot of foreign ministers, not just in Africa, but in other parts of the global South. You hear the same thing coming out of Southeast Asia, in Latin America, and South Asia as well, that they don't want to be sucked into this great power rivalry. That being said, we're in this new era of the great power rivalry. It's here. And we've talked about this at length in in our various writings on the subject that developing countries like South Africa are going to have to find a space to move in. And you see Minister Pandora really trying to carve out that flexibility for herself that says, we want to be able to engage any country that we want on the terms that we want without facing external pressure. Did you hear that as well? Yeah, no, totally. Like the, you know, kind of. I think that the thing she was, she was really kind of like, you know, drawing that line very clearly. Well, let's go through the pronouncement of principles, as you said they are. There are four main pillars in the new U.S. strategy for Africa, and you're going to notice, Cobus, that it's very, very different than what we heard in the last time the United States launched a strategy for Africa. That was Prosper Africa. That was done at the Heritage Foundation by National Security Advisor John Bolton in the Trump administration, when in his speech he mentioned China 14 times. In the Blinken speech on Monday, China was only mentioned twice, but really passively in the context of debt relief and climate change. So the four pillars that we have in the new strategy, foster openness and open societies, deliver democratic and security dividends, advance pandemic recovery and economic opportunity, support conservation, climate adaptation, and a just energy transition. What's interesting, Cobus, and I drew this comparison earlier this week between the white paper on China-Africa relations that the Chinese State Council published in the run-up to Last year's FOCAC conference in Dakar really provides us with an opportunity to compare the strategy document from the United States with a strategy document from the Chinese. And what's interesting about the Chinese is they put a lot more hard metrics in their document, whereas the United States was really more of a vision document, kind of an expression of principles rather than firm goals. When you look at the two documents and you read through the American strategy, what did you take away from it? In many ways, I think the American strategy was it seems very promising. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of focus on I think issues that young Africans particularly would be very interested in, but you know, in relation to climate transition, in relation to to democratization, you know, kind of openness and transparency, accountable governance, as as Joseph pointed out, is is, is a key issue. So all of all of those are very are very um, you know kind of heartening. I think um, I do think, as you say, you know, kind of on the Chinese side, they tend to put a lot of metrics there, which also then makes it quite easy to see whether things or relatively easy. I mean, it's it's a complicated thing to to research, but but to 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 actually track you know whether things have been achieved or not. You know, and on the U.S. side, the, the there's a lot of of, of broad goals. Um, uh, you know, the, the word engagement and cooperation came up many, many times. And one of the things that I that I kind of was asking in a column that I wrote for our newsletter today was I was wondering what kind of platforms they have in mind for all of this engagement. Um, like what particularly on issues. So so one of the things that they, that they point out is that they, um, you know, in, in encouraging democratization, and obviously this is a thing that the U.S. has focused on a long time, is that they they focus on a in a, a a mixture of of um you know of, of what do you call it like enticements or or you know kind of encouragements um like measures of 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 um of rewarding democratization and then using sanctions and other measures to punish democratic backsliding and i was wondering like what kind of decision making platform there's going to be to decide which countries are backsliding you know is that is that kind of uh, is everyone going to be essentially is is that is that going to be a decision made in Washington or is there or is there some kind of like shared space in which these these kind of things can be hashed out because you know what like as as I pointed out in some cases like for example around the 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 um, call from the ECOWAS um, you know West African Regional Economic Community. 
uh, calls for sanctions against Ma- the, the military government in Mali, there is some, you know, kind of support for the use of sanctions in, in, in particular cases. But in the case of Zimbabwe, for example, African countries have repeatedly been calling for the lifting of sanctions against Zimbabwe over a long time. And we've seen that the sanctions has actually entrenched autocratic government in Zimbabwe and has actually opened the space for for much, much enhanced and shady um, kind of, you know, engagement from both Russia and China in Zimbabwe. So so sanctions isn't necessarily this great cure-all to to ensure democracy. And it's a little unclear in this document who's going to be making the call about what kind of pragmatic cooperation should be allowed and which kind should be, you know, what kind of backsliding should be punished. So so that's one thing that I, that I was wondering a little bit about, like, how is this going to work concretely, particularly considering that, you know, there isn't there isn't really a FOCAC style kind of formal platform for, for engagement. And, they, and there's also not the kind of non-stop, endless kind of diplomatic engagement that you see from Chinese Chinese diplomats, where there's several of several, you know, kind of high ranking people visiting, you know, the, the continent over over months. So, you know, so, so that that's an issue. I think, what, what did you think? Well, they have the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit that's going to be coming up later this year, so that might be a venue for this type of discussion. Generally speaking, though, those summits are pretty saccharine. They don't really get they're into too many but details. But also, they're also infrequent. You know, kind of. So, so it's not like there's a yearly U.S. you know Africa Leaders Summit. It's like now and then. Yeah, unlike FOCAC, it's not institutionalized, so we don't know when the next U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit is going to be, if there will be one. Especially if the Republicans it's in, it's come a, back into power. It's slated for December well, this year. That's right. But, but after we'll that, we don't that. know if it'll happen again in one year, three years, five years. If Trump didn't really want to do that kind of thing. So if Trump comes back into power again, it becomes much more unpredictable. The stability of the Chinese way of doing it is something that I think people really tend to appreciate. So that's very interesting. I want to get your take on one thing. Does it matter that in each of the four pillars that the United States is emphasizing for Africa, that the United States itself is really struggling with? And not just in a one throwaway line that everybody in the foreign policy establishment, both from the think tanks and from people like Blinken himself, say, you know, they have this one line that says, we too are struggling with these same things, and then they expect that to kind of cover everything. The fact is, is that there's been a retrenchment of civil liberties in the United States, The fact is that the United States is having a democracy problem. It itself, according to Freedom House's index, has been falling. We have a Gini coefficient now in terms of the wealth divide that is on par with Honduras. Uh, Our economic opportunity is, is, is struggling at best. We have a caste system in terms of race. And there is just no way that the United States can position itself as a leader on what they say is conservation, climate adaptation, and just energy transition. I mean, the United States is the largest fossil fuel exporter in the world. Getting a climate bill through Congress, which just happened, barely happened, barely happened. And the Republicans have made it clear that they're going to support the fossil fuel industry when they come back into power. So I looked through all four of these key points. And to me, the United States may not be the best messenger on this today. Do you think that matters in Africa, when someone like Blinken comes to town and starts talking about the importance of open societies, and we've had a retrenchment here on open societies. I think it complicates the situation, you know, kind of the, because in the first place, obviously, the U- United States is so massive and so complex that it says one thing on, on a kind of a federal government level, and there's, there's all kinds of other things happening at, at other levels. You know, so, so I think the more, the more people consume U.S. media, the more people take note of what's happening in the U.S., the more kind of complex their views on these issues become in relation to the U.S. Um, you know, so so I think, I, th- I do think it, it, it's going to be a complicating issue. Um, and this is just, you know, this is, um, for example, like like years ago already, like, like I think 10 years ago, I was, I was teaching... Um, uh, no, it's actually a little bit less than that. But anyway, I was I was teaching a media studies class, and um, and I asked them I, at that stage. I was I was I was focusing on the the media construction of of states, um, and particularly like the the construction of national image. And so I asked these um, these students at Wits that um, who were all the all young black women, um, and I asked them, um, you know, kind of if they could just get an all expensive paid um, international vacation, where would they go? 
Um, and I 100% expected everyone to say New York. Um, I was expecting New York and Paris. They ended up saying... They they were like raising kind of like like resorts in Mozambique, for example, and uh, and I asked them, so why not the United States? And they they were like saying like, oh, as black people, we we don't want to be hassled by the police, like we don't want to we don't want trouble, um, you know. And it it was revealing for me that that was such a that was such a kind of like a the immediate kind of response to that, and so so these kind of issues in the U.S. tend to seep. Like what happens in the US, you know, is immediately visible to to the rest of the world, and so it has these kind of impacts. Um, but at the same time, still the the kind of massive, overwhelming role of the United States, you know, kind of still does lean towards promoting democracy, you know. Um, but I do think issues like, for example, the, the the death of Roe versus Wade, I think, you know, kind of did did kind of have a a, a real impact. Like I remember someone, like an African, was tweeting, um, like. A, a, you know, a commentator was tweeting, um, if, if, you know, soon after, after soon after Roe versus Wade fell, said that, oh, yeah, I might want to, I, in the past I wanted to immigrate to, to America, but now it'll be like living in, in Gilead, you know, like in, in The Handmaid's Tale. Um, you know, so I think I think those kind of, those, those, those kind of rollbacks do have an impact, but I think their impact is, 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 is more felt among highly educated and, you know, kind of media literate people more than the wider conversation. Over the wider, wider population, I mean. It's not just in Roe versus Wade and abortion rights, but there's also been a restructuring of voter access laws in about 19 states that makes it more difficult. There's been a difficulty, if not an impossibility, in reforming police unions and police brutality issues. So these are issues that, again, are closely followed on YouTube. And it'd be interesting to see if African publics, particularly young people, uh, start to question the United States and their legitimacy in being the vehicle for talking about some of these issues that the United States itself is struggling with. Let's quickly pivot before we go to talk about the role of China. The team behind this document explicitly went out of their way to downplay China compared to what the Trump administration did, and instead they wanted to really put forth what they called an affirmative vision of the United States rather than a reactionary catch-up to what the Chinese or the Russians are doing in Africa. Nonetheless, uh, Secretary Blinken, although he didn't name China by name in his speech, he did reference it indirectly. Let's take a listen to how China came up in, again, albeit indirectly, in Secretary Blinken's address at the University of Pretoria about the new U.S. strategy for Africa. The way this infrastructure is built will reverberate for decades. After all, we've seen the consequences. When international infrastructure deals are corrupt and coercive, when they're poorly built or environmentally destructive, when they import or abuse workers or burden countries with crushing debts. That's why it's so important for countries to have choices to be able to weigh them transparently with the input of local communities without pressure or coercion. So Kobus, he didn't name the Chinese by name, but he used the word coercion a number of times. That is the word of the day, by the way, in the White House in terms of referring to the Chinese. That is a word that has popped up just in 2022 a lot more. What was your reaction to that part of the speech? I mean, you know, it's like, like, you know, the one calling the other coercive, uh, you know, it's like, it's like, I find that I find that particular framing a little unconvincing, considering, you know, kind of the complexities of relationships between African governments and China and the Chinese government that we've been following for a long time. But I, I would add to to Secretary Blinken's thing is like, yeah, like, sure, badly, badly built infrastructure has decades long impact. You know, what also has decades long impact? No infrastructure. That has decade long impact, um, you know, and that has been that has been the 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 dominant effect of of these kind of shifts that we've seen in a unipolar system of thinking in places like the World Bank, for example, you know, kind of so the pivot that we saw in the World Bank away from building large scale hard infrastructure that we saw in the nineties and two thousands had this massive knock on effect that then that then the Chinese among others stepped into in order to 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 provide that demand. So it's not only kind of bad infrastructure on the Chinese side, it's all of these kind of planning decisions that happened in places like New York and London 
that then impact on the global south in you know kind of in in a context of very little competition so in that sense this kind of geo- geopolitical competition that's now currently being framed in washington as coercion from the chinese can very easily be also be framed as just simply a, a kind of a marketplace of 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 contenders actually trying like competing for you know kind of for for business in in these global south countries which i think is a is a healthier framing yeah, that statement deserves a fact check on a number of different levels. First of all, the Chinese are not importing large numbers of workers anymore to Africa. For some bizarro reason, the secretary continues to think that's the case. Whoever is advising the secretary needs to really update their data. There's a ton of research has been done on this in Angola, in Ethiopia, and other places. And the Chinese just don't have the labor pools that they once had to be able to export them around the world. Number two, on the quality infrastructure What the secretary is not saying and what Chinese project managers will tell you in private is that a lot of the reasons why the infrastructure is crappy when it's built in Africa by Chinese contractors actually doesn't have that much to do with the Chinese side, but has to do with local corruption that siphons off large parts of the budget before it gets to the contractor. Now, again, I'm not trying to say anything to excuse the contractors, but one of the things that we have seen from World Bank projects and World Bank data is that when the Chinese participate in those World Bank projects, the the surveys come back and the data comes back that the Chinese quality is average or above average. And so, again, it's a little bit of a trope for them to come out and really blanket to say that uh, the Chinese infrastructure has quality problems. So lastly, this idea on coercion, and I'd like to get your take on this. I find it highly, highly paternalistic and patronizing. And this is, again, let's go back to a statement by Director General Wu Peng in the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He's China's top diplomat for sub-Saharan Africa. And he said very clearly last year, we're not putting a gun to anybody's head to take these deals. Nobody is forcing any African government to sign a crappy contract. If they don't want the contract, they can walk away at any point. Okay. Yes, to your point, Kobus, there aren't a lot of options, but coercion is, I don't think, being used here. I think that's a BS line. And it undermines African agency here. It says basically they're too stupid or they're too naive or they're too vulnerable, whatever they are, to be able to understand how to deal with the Chinese. And let's go back to Minister Pandora's comments. Again, a forceful articulation of their sovereignty and their agency in their relationships with other countries. And to suggest that the that an African country is being coerced by the Chinese undermines that agency, in my view. Yeah, I mean that fits into the into the the broader kind of narrative that we see from 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 Western diplomats a lot. That there is you know, where where they seem to assume that there's no earthly reason why anyone would actually want to work with the Chinese. So they must be forced in some kind of way. Um or they must be corrupt. You know, kind of they're either being forced or they're corrupt. Um or you know, or they're being duped. Um, you know, which which is which you know kind of ends up being a very revealing view of the global south. You know, kind of like the governments are either are either craven or 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 dupes. You know, um, so you know, so that's not great. Um, the other issue that I wanted to to actually raise with you is a very minor issue, but like it, it was interesting one for me. Deep in this this document, in this in the. Um, uh, the strategy document that that was that was circulated as part of this. There's, there's this mention that that they're planning on 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 closing what they call geographical seams between different regions. So they're looking at at looking more closely at the at sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa together. But they're also talking about about and it, it just really is only barely mentioned in one sentence. But they're saying they're interested in pulling Africa into the Indo-Pacific framework. So I was wondering, do you think that is that a, a, an oblique reference to to extending this kind of securitized idea of the Indo-Pacific right to the Indian Ocean coast in in Africa? Because in the past, the the the, the Pentagon's view of the of the Indo-Pacific tended to have a line kind of going down the Indian Ocean, you know, kind of. So it it wasn't formally kind of pulling Africa in always. So do you think that's changing? That would be my assumption. And when I read it, that was my assumption that that was for a security framework. And the whole creation of the Indo-Pacific language and architecture is in a security context. So by bringing that into the African strategy document, yes, that would be my assumption as well. One thing to think about, though, that the United States government as an organization is highly siloed. 
highly siloed in terms of regions, highly siloed in terms of functionalities. And the other issue that comes out is the fact that the United States in Africa is severely understaffed in its diplomatic missions. So these ambitions that the United States is laying out in this document have to be fulfilled by people. And when I start to see this integration with the Indo-Pacific and all this new initiatives for democracy and and all the things that they want to do, you got to wonder, who's going to do it? It's a lot of people. And, And the challenge that the State Department faces here, and this is something that's a longstanding issue that goes back decades, is that Congress continues to ask the State Department to do more things. We want you to survey human rights. We want you to do a report on Xinjiang. We want you to do blah, 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 blah. But the Congress then does not provide additional funding in order to do that. So what you end up having is a political officer or an economic officer in embassy X, Y, or Z having now to do five jobs. So one has to be a little bit skeptical about these ambitions as to how they're going to be carried out. One last thing I want to kind of put to you as a point of reference here in terms of how the United States prioritizes its engagement with the world. The military budget is north of $800 billion, okay? Largest in the world by far, multiples larger than everybody else. The State Department's budget is 23, 24 billion? Still a large number. I mean, most countries couldn't even dream of 23, 24 billion. But when you have a mandate as large as what the United States has, and these documents only make that worse. 24 billion actually doesn't go that far, but that gap between the diplomacy side and the military side really speaks volumes as to where their priorities are. Final comments from you before we go. Yeah, I mean, I think this this is one of the big challenges for the United States is for everything to not become a military concern. You know, for, for, for that kind of like seep of, of, of kind of military engagement to not kind of like slowly kind of like take over everything else. That that I think is, is has been a is a long term challenge and, and I think it's particularly one in Africa because it has because the United States plays a a really big and also valued in, in, in many places security role as well um, on the continent you know so so it it becomes there's a little bit of a of a danger particularly in 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 unstable and fragile societies there's a little bit of a you know if you have a hammer everything becomes a nail kind of problem you know kind of where where there's a the kind of a security creep in terms of in terms of their their engagement where everything starts to look like like a like a, a security issue and i think that, that particularly with the, with with the kind of combination of a very young population and very high levels of unemployment you know on the continent that that makes for a, an unstable kind of combination you know so so i think that it it's interesting to, to to track that, I think. Well, the good news for the United States that Joseph pointed out is that they've picked four pillars and topics that are very much in alignment with the sentiments of a large swath of the population across the continent. So in that sense, they should be congratulated. It's a great, great, interesting read to, to go through. We've done quite a bit of analysis on our website. Again, we dedicated an entire issue of our daily brief this week to it. So if you're a subscriber, go and check your inbox for that. If you are also a subscriber, you can go onto the site at chinaglobalsouth.com and you can read all of our analysis there. We would love to have you as a subscriber. If you don't already get the daily brief, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Subscriptions are very affordable, $7 a month for students and teachers, $15 a month for everybody else. This is the stuff that a lot of folks in the DC Beltway are reading, also in London, in Paris, in Johannesburg, in Pretoria, and in Beijing. We're very excited that we have some readers inside the Chinese Foreign Ministry as well, so that's uh, that's pretty cool for us to be able to do that. So anyway, we'll leave the discussion there. Cobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the show. Until then... For Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrikchin on Twitter. That's Afrik with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.